Welcome everybody to the Physical Education with Coach channel. I'm your coach, Coach Cullen Carroll, and today we're going to start our lecture series. So as you can see by the screen, our first topic of the year is going to be scientific foundations of physical education. Building a knowledge base in any academic area of interest, just like building a house, starts with establishing something foundational to build the house upon. So see our rationale here as the reason we're going over the foundations of PE is because I want you to be able to develop the skills and extract all the knowledge possible from us as your teachers, the textbooks, the videos, and all the resources that we have available to you. So today, let's start on that foundation. Here's an idea of our outline. Okay, we have an intro, a scientific method, we have health and medical sciences, kinesiology, nutritional sciences, and then we're going to talk briefly about work, warm-ups, workouts, and cool-downs. And here's my goals for you by the end of this lesson. I want you to be able to describe the scientific method, define the health and medical sciences, define the nutrition sciences, define the kinesiological sciences, believe it or not, there's more than one. And then I want you to describe and differentiate between warm-ups, workouts, and cool-downs. These are all skills, foundational skills, in understanding physical education as a discipline. So let's start with our intro here. So if we're talking about scientific foundations, we want to know what the word science means. And science is the study of knowledge based on observation and experimentation. So a lot of this is left to what we can see, specifically in the physical education realm. We're working with experiments that we can see and we can gain knowledge from. So we're going to see a lot of observation studies where, for example, you observe PE classes, implement routines, and understand what the benefits are by analyzing your data. So there are several types of sciences. We have the natural sciences, which involves nature around us things like biology, chemistry, and physics. We have the social sciences, which are more integrated with humans, right? looking at behavior, psychology, sociology, geography. And don't get me wrong, there is a lot of uh, animal behavior that's observed in social science. But again, particularly, we're focusing on humans when it comes to physical education. And then we have mathematics, which are numbers and operations. Okay. We've seen this in such classes as algebra, geometry, calculus, or particularly in our school, we have integrated 1, integrated 2, integrated 3. We have calculus, AP statistics, and all of those fun mathematics courses. Computer's being a little slow right now. There we go. Let me make sure I can go back and forth here. I think I skipped a couple slides. So next is the scientific method. What is the scientific method? Well, it's used for discovering new knowledge, establishing principles, and solving problems. So if you had a question, you would take that question and you would make a prediction or a hypothesis. Then you would carry out your experimentation to test your hypothesis. And during your experimentation, actually before, during, and after, you should be collecting data, right? Whatever you can to achieve the goal of testing your hypothesis. Then you're going to want to analyze that data. And after you've analyzed that data, you can come up with a conclusion and you can discuss your findings through the report. So if you don't know, I just talked you through the six steps of basically how the scientific method is put into an experiment. And we see that not only at the high school level with our PE classes and science classes and mathematics classes. But we see this as the major foundation to performing research and writing articles at the collegiate and professional level as well. So as you can tell, the scientific method is, is not only for your science classes, but it's also going to be a tool to help you build a healthy living, a healthy lifestyle, and a fitness program for yourself. Now let's change gears. Let's go into a typical or a specific type of science, right? One of the most important ones I would say on earth is going to be our health and medical sciences. So 
the art and science of medicine is going to be the art and science of healing, right? So what we want to do in the field of health and medical sciences is we want to find a patient, or hopefully the patient finds the doctor if we cannot access them. We diagnose what the issue is, and then we focus on treating the disease at hand, and hopefully later we get to some of the underlying symptoms, and we figure out how we can prevent that disease from reoccurring or prevent other, other diseases from happening in the future. Our modern practice for health and medical science is evidence-based, meaning that it relies on research, meaning that it relies on the scientific method. Okay, So you have to have a foundation of research studies before you implement any kind of procedure or any kind of practices in a hospital or in a medical office. So just to give you an example of what modern medicine has done for us, over the, the history of, of humans and, and mankind, I guess you could say, is one big one is doubling life expectancy, right? So if we're looking at the last century, we're talking, you know, 1900s up to 2020 here. We've gone from about a 47-year life expectancy to about an 80-year life expectancy, which is a massive feat. We've conquered bacterial diseases like typhoid, like smallpox, uh, through the implementation of medications, through the implementation of vaccines, we've seen a, a large drop in a lot of these <clears throat> viruses and bacterial infections that have gotten rid of large portions of the population throughout history. And then another thing is the production of over 10,000 medicines that have become available to doctors to implement their specific evidence-based styles of treatment. It's quite an impressive thing to be a part of. Instead of having to rely on a lack of research and a lack of supplies, you have access to more and the opportunity to do more because of the scientific method. Um, what else can we look at in terms of health and medical sciences? So knowing what modern medicine has done for us over the past century, one of the things that it's, that is done for us is shifted us from a concern of these acute diseases to the idea of chronic diseases, right? So with a longer life expectancy and less of a chance dying from uh, viruses and bacteria, bacterial infections, what do we have to worry about? We have to worry about chronic things like heart disease, cancer, which are the number one and two leading cause of death world, worldwide. Uh, we have metabolic disorders now plaguing us, like diabetes. And then we have uh, other related illnesses related to lifestyle choices, such as uh, excessive smoking, excessive drinking, recreational drug use, and those types of things that can lead to a lot of chronic issues in the internal organs and most of the organs in our body. <clears throat> so you have medical science. What about health science. Well, health science is going to be that back-end piece that I was talking about, where once you figure out what the issue is, you diagnose it, you start treating the symptoms of it, now we have to start teaching the patient to prevent such things happening in the future. And that's where you get health science, which focuses on preventing disease and promoting wellness. And, you know, health science has become extremely important with medical science helping us alleviate the mankind's population of acute diseases, right? So mainly everything we're dealing with now are chronic diseases. So this idea of preventative health care and wellness promotion is becoming one of the most important overarching topics in society. Uh, these, these scientists will typically study personal health issues and public health scientists will study health and, and illness among populations, right? Sometimes we call those health and illness studies, um, epidemiology reports, and those are epidemiologist scientists. And most of them have to have a background in, in a lot of the basic sciences, as well as mathematics, because as, as an epidemiologist, keep in mind, you're crunching data in order to understand what the figures are telling us about society's habits and how we can correct those habits. So let's get a little bit more into what physical education comes from. Well, Physical education actually comes from this big overarching branch here, which is kinesiology. 
And kinesiology is exercise science. That's another way of putting it. More typically, the definition is the study of human movement. And when we think of these human movements, we're typically emphasizing large muscle act physical activities. Okay, we're not really talking a lot about hand movements, um, you know, fine motor movements. We're talking a lot about gross motor movements when we look at kinesiology. But don't get me wrong, fine motor movements, movements are an important aspect in physical education, which is why we'll talk about those a little bit later. So exercise science kind of emerged in the late 20th century um, from the concept of health science. And it's because we, it started becoming important to get people physically active. And once we started learning about the benefits of physical activity and exercise, it revealed that this needed to be a separate element of education and a separate element of academics that we could then teach people about, right? Because one of the foundations of our Western society, as you guys know, is the idea of education, educa educating our citizens so that we have a, a higher class, a higher learning level, a higher academic achievement level of our citizens. And so being that it's important to understand preventative health care now and the benefits of exercise, this has become a topic that is not only learned K through 12 with physical education, but now it's being learned in colleges and professional areas around. Um, so some of the movements that you might see studied in kinesiology would be walking, aerobics, sport, basketball, baseball, hockey, recreation, strength training, like weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding, and then flexibility, things like yoga, uh, excuse me, things like yoga, and then typical stretching programs. So like I mentioned, there are seven major c categories with kinesiology and to earn a PE degree as well as become a PE teacher, you have to at least have visited those topics in your academic career once, but you should also gain a specific mastery of some of those topics and how they can uh, improve or contribute to your physical education knowledge and your curriculum. So the first one is exercise physiology. Okay, and this one, as you could imagine, coming from biology, physiology, it's gonna be a study of the body systems and how those body systems are going to react to physical activity. So it's very mechanistic. And what I mean by mechanistic is you will have individuals identifying single cells and pathways inside the body and just looking at how those things react to simple activities such as walking or running or sprinting or lifting a heavy weight. Some examples would be studying the effects of exercise on the hearts, heart and vessels, maybe studying the effects on the lungs or the effects on the muscles, bones, other systems. So you could see I just put in exercise, name a system, pick a portion of that system, and you try and see what happens with that system or that organ based on the exercise routine. It's important because it's essential for planning physical activity programs, and it helps us to promote lifelong wellness. The next category or the next science is going to be biomechanics. Okay, and that's if you were to take our body and turn it into a machine or view it as a machine, this would technically be the study of biomechanics, right? So our bones are these levers, our joints are these fulcrums that allow rotation or movement in our body, and then we have these motors, which are the muscle, which is also controlled by the nerves and the brain, and we're seeing how this biological machine functions. So what we're looking at in biomechanics is trying to understand the body through the art and science of physics. Okay, so some examples would be studying forces or studying velocity of movement, maybe displacement, which is just a change in position. And we could look at that through the bones. We could look at those elements through the muscles. We could uh, look at it during a static exercise, during a dynamic exercise. And this helps us overall uh, it's important because it helps us to learn to move efficiently and avoid injury. And the other thing is it can contribute to some of the different categories, which we'll see in the future. So you can see some um, three-dimensional graphics there of the type of pictures that might be recreated in a biomechanics study. The next one is exercise psychology. Again, I, th I think most of us are fond 
of psychology. It's the science of the mind and then the behavior that goes along with it, right? So what you're trying to do is look at the physiological functions of the brain and understand why some behavior patterns are occurring, right? So what we can do with this is we can focus on behavior as it pertains to physical acti activity and sport. How it, you know, what are the physical attitudes, physiological, sorry, psychological attitudes prior to, during, afterwards? What are our mood states, right? How do our sleep levels affect our mood states? What's our anxiety rates, okay? So an example would be subjective feelings related to sport and exercise routines, possibly like the wellness questionnaire, the RPE that you guys do every single day for physical education class. So you're already using some of these tools and maybe you just didn't even know it yet. So the importance of psychology really comes from an intrinsic factor, right? It's, it's showing us how to motivate people to be active as a PE teacher showing you how to be motivated to be active as a student, teaching us how to teach you how to set goals, you learning how to set goals, right? Becoming more proficient with tasks and establishing a positive mood state, a positive attitude, a low anxiety state with that. <clears throat> it's getting a little slow at changing slides here. All right. Next category is exercise anatomy. So we're reverting back to our biological branch of kinesiology, but this one focuses purely on structure. That's what anatomy is, is kind of synonymous with, right? We're looking at the structure of our biological organism. So scientists that are looking at exercise anatomy will typically look at body tissues like muscle bones, tendons, ligaments, skin, and they might be looking um, for certain actions that produce movements. Okay, so they're very familiar with the origins and insertions of muscles, bones, tendons, the location of these elements on the body, and they want to see what is producing improper or proper exercise movements, and if that has to do with a person's exercise anatomy, or if that exercise anatomy can be altered, or more, more extreme, they want to see what happens to an individual when we have to remove a limb due to unfortunate circumstances, and you have to put prosthetics on people, prosthetic legs, prosthetic arms, and this comes back again to that fine gross motor movement we might be putting on, um, you know, prosthetic fingers and toes that are going to help them with some of the intricate portions of movement quality. This is also uh, very helpful in some of the broader aspects of physical education like selecting appropriate exercises for certain areas of the body based on your goals. The next one is exercise sociology. So that's going to be the study of society and the relationships within society. Right, so exercise sociology is going to focus on <clears throat> these two occurrences with physical activity and sport. So we might look at things like teamwork, cooperation, social responsibility, cultural, as well as ethnic differences. But we might look at that in relation to the game of football or in relation to the game of rugby. Or we might compare the two. What does teamwork and cooperation mean to a softball player versus a baseball player? What does social responsibility and ethnic differences look like in hockey versus field hockey? Okay. So it's important because it helps us with experiencing positive social interactions and physical activity. Okay. The, the reason why we implement team sports and physical education is so you can get a concept of all these different occurrences like teamwork, cooperation, social responsibility, cultural, ethnic differences, how they're experienced by you in a game of soccer versus how they're experienced by your classmate in a game of soccer. How can you learn to work together? How can you learn to understand your differences yet become similar and produce a winning result and a positive attitude in physical education? Another one is motor learning. Okay, This comes back to the fine versus gross motor skill <clears throat> concepts. So motor learning is strictly the skill you know, learning, skilled learning, okay? So for example, what are the steps that I would take to learning how to throw a basket, uh, throw a baseball? What are the steps I would take towards 
learning how to shoot a free throw? What are the steps I would take towards shooting a penalty shot in <clears throat> soccer? Okay. So when I'm talking here, think movement skills, motor skills, they can be synonymous. And we see that in the standards as well. It refers to movement and motor skills. But really, we're, we're looking at this overarching theme of um, how, do we, how do we achieve skill learning? Okay. So when, when a skill is learned, the brain is going to send a signal through a nerve to the muscle, and that muscle is going to contract. Right? And we can tie this in to a lot of these different sciences we've already learned. Remember, with that same pattern, once we get to the muscle, that turns into a motor. We want to look at how that motor is moving the lever, the bone, and how that lever is moving around the fulcrum, the joint. Okay, So a lot of these things start combining, and you can start to see how just something as simple as learning to throw a baseball might seem easy to one kid. Okay, but if you see a student struggling, now you can start to understand there's a lot of working pieces here. And there's a lot of scientific foundations underlying why or why not that person can learn to throw a baseball in one day versus an entire year. So we have muscles and nerves working together to pr produce movements. And just to, for some basic nomenclature, we call that a motor unit, right? The nerve that innervates the muscles that produce movements when the nerve sends a signal. That's the motor unit. <clears throat> An example of motor learning would be observing the nerves as well as the muscles active in throwing or kicking a ball, right? Looking at the sequential pattern of activation going through the body as the person is learning the skills of throwing or kicking. Typically what we get out of this, and we'll see a lot of these use this year, um, you've already seen a couple of them in some of our progression videos for doing things like push-ups and curl-ups and squats. You see progressions because we're trying to establish a set proper pattern before we get to the full movement, right? We're doing part of the movement, and then we're going to learn the whole movement after we learn a series of parts, and we can put that sum of parts into a whole proper movement. <clears throat> so as you could imagine, the importance of motor learning is going to be the efficiency of learning movement skills, right? If we, if we go through the pattern for which it's most likely learned in a population, we can probably achieve that skill a lot quicker, depending on the individual, obviously. And then we get to us, the final branch of kinesiology, our, our physical educators, right? And we put that under physical ed education and pedagogy because we're not just teaching movement. We're also trying to understand how to teach and how to learn properly with the science of pedagogy, right? And, and pedagogy is the art and science of teaching. So scientists will typically observe and analyze the best ways to teach, and <clears throat> they'll try to find the best factors that are going to affect learning. Like, for example, one that I hear every day and I firmly believe in is, is the best way to learn something is to teach it. And that's why we try to do a lot of that in physical education, and I think that's why physical education can be somewhat of an easier topic because there are more opportunities to teach to learn on a daily basis. So take advantage of that. Sports pedagogy, therefore, would refer to sport coaching, physical education coaching, as well as fitness coaching, like being a personal trainer or maybe a strength and conditioning coach. Just again, for some more nomenclature, sport is a broad term. Okay, it, It's going to encompass everything from cycling to hiking to calisthenics to lifting weights to playing a game of basketball or any other sport, playing a uh, volleyball, playing you know a singles sport like tennis or golf, it's all under that overarching umbrella of sport. And then an example uh, of a study that you might see in physical education or pedagogy would be applying motor learning to help students improve skills, and then applying management principles to increase physical activity, and then using motivational principles to encourage the optimal learning, learning environment. So you kind of have a three-parter there. All right, so now that we're out of kinesiology, we have one more science that I just want to unveil today for what makes up a physical education teacher, and that is nutrition science. It's one of the things that is commonly neglected, and even though um, we spent a lot of time on movement science, I will say nutrition is one of the most important aspects of health and wellness. I do not think it is the most important, and the reason I say that is because we see less people moving and moving 
nowadays, and the first instinct is to criticize them on their diet. Okay. Now, when someone is sedentary because their job demands they're sedentary or because the world is so easily accessible that they never have to leave their house, I see that as a possible way of a first intervention being movement, not necessarily nutrition. But again, disclaimer, just because I don't think it is the most important aspect does not mean it is an important aspect. Okay, I see all kinds of um, obtuse statistics being thrown out. 80% of, of you know health and wellness is diet, and 90% of, of change in a woman's body is due to nutrition. Just stop. Okay, they, they equally contribute as much right? Nutrition is just important as movement. And just like any healthy relationship, without the two contributing, you cannot have optimum health and wellness. Okay? So what is nutrition science? It's the study of how plants and animals use food to grow and sustain life. Scientists study carbohydrates, fats, proteins. Okay, those are our main, our big three macros. Then you have vitamins and minerals as well as water, I like to throw in there as our main micros. And they want to do this in order to understand, understand how they contribute to the growth of our tissues and the development of our organism as a whole. And again, you can take this a step further because there are plenty of nutritional science studies that deal with exercise, right? We can not just look at how these affect the tissues, but we can look at how these uh, nutrients affect the tissues during jogging during cycling, during weight training, okay? Uh, when a proper diet is implemented during a training study, we can look at changes of proper nutrition, right, what they call a plant-based diet, compared with the standard American diet or a vegan or vegetarian diet. Like there's lots of different options out there that we can look at and we can read about in some of these studies. So food science is typically looking at the studies um, <clears throat> studies that look at the chemical makeup of food, right? Like, um, you know, something produced in a lab, like, uh, they have a couple of different types of vegan meats that are produced in labs. Now, you know, maybe you would look at the comparison of that vegan meat produced in a lab compared with something a little more natural that comes off of a cow, which is ground beef. Um, food technology is going to study processing, packaging, preservation, as well as safety of foods, right? So we have a big issue with this in our country right now. Um, I think a lot of people experience issues from preservatives, but the, the hard part to mediate from that is how do we preserve a lot of the foods that we need to stay preserved for a long period of time. <clears throat> and then you have, um, you know, what would classically be termed the experts in nutrition science, which would be the dietitian. All right. And you can typically look for that distinction at the end of a person's name, usually says something like RD, registered dietitian. And these are experts that are going to help people take these nutritional concepts and put them into action, right? And like I said, again, going back to my disclaimer, it's not that I don't think nutrition is important. I think movement is more important. I think movement is always going to be more important. And that's strictly because of my bias as a physical education teacher. But the nice thing about having a dietitian around I want to throw this out there is you don't have to focus as much on that nutrition uh, aspect because you have that expert coming in being able to distinguish what different individuals need in your environment right so you know a dietitian for me who's a relatively healthy individual might not be that important but let's say I had a class and I had a couple of diabetics I had a couple of kids with early heart heart disease and um, <clears throat> I had a couple kids with let's say, uh, you know, uh, some long-term muscle injuries. It'd be nice to have a, a dietitian in class to help the kids that were healthy with a nice broad diet. And then she could go, he or she could go to those individual students with diabetes, let's say, for example, and set them a special diet to help them succeed at exercise as well as life. Go to those students that are experiencing long-term injuries and can't seem to get out of a rut and maybe help them clean up their diet a little bit and get a little bit more nutrient that they might be missing out. You know, maybe they're protein deficient or iron deficient, something along those lines. And maybe you can go to those kids with heart disease, pre-heart disease, and say, I'm going to give you a, a diet specific to you. So it's always good to have an expert around to be able to, to, to help individualize diet plans as opposed, um, not as opposed, but as a supplement to a physical education teacher.
Okay, so now that we have a little bit of the foundation of where physical education comes from, let's start to look at some of the basic <clears throat> fundamental, um, let's say, plans that go into a physical education course. Um, I would say a pretty large aspect of physical education focuses around three major aspects, and that's the warm-up, the workout, and the cool-down. And the reason is we can essentially meet all three of our high school standards and all five of those high school standards at the K through 8 level just from these three activities if they are implemented correctly. And that's why you see that every single day, most physical education teachers will try to get these three elements into their, their daily curriculum, right? Their daily lesson plan. So an activity session has typically three phases, as you can see from the title, the warm up, which is performed before the workout, the workout, which is the main part of the activity. Usually we're trying to improve fitness. We're trying to have a competition, whether it's a game or a sport, maybe, or we're doing some type of an activity for fun. Maybe it's a leisure day where we're playing some cornhole, we're playing some disc golf, something like that. And then you have a cool down at the end of your routine. And this is going to be performed after the workout or the, the competition or the activity. And we want to do that in order to aid in recovery and prepare us for the next day's lesson or the next day's warm up and workout. Oh no. We got a, another slow click here. I apologize for the long pauses in between slides. All right, so let's look at uh, a little more in depth of what a warm up is. So typically, <clears throat> the most common warm ups you probably see are static stretches. Okay. Now, when we dive into the literature, the recent research is going to show us that a warm up that is mainly static stretches is probably going to reduce performance and it may not increase your likelihood of injury but it might not decrease your injury prevention okay when you do a warm up the whole point of a warm up is that we are improving the probability that we'll have a good performance we're decreasing the probability that we will get injured okay and we're generally prepared for an activity. I don't know if any of you have ever stretched before. I'm hoping you have because we've been doing stretches for a couple of weeks in my class. But typically after you do a static stretching routine, you're kind of relaxed, right? Your muscles are returned back to or beyond their normal length. They're not necessarily prepared for a vigorous physical activity, which is what you're trying to do with the warm up. You're trying to prepare for a moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is required about 40 minutes a day every day for the year which is why we exercise every day so think about that if we're supposed to be doing something physically challenging every single day would you need to feel relaxed or would you need to feel excited warm maybe a little bit ready to go your temperatures elevated your muscles are feeling hot all the energy has been delivered to your body your blood is flowing would that be a better feeling than feeling like you're gonna fall asleep prior to a warm-up I mean, I wouldn't call myself the expert, but I'm going to go ahead and say a dynamic warm-up is probably a little more beneficial than a static warm-up. So here's some of the guidelines. <clears throat> I think we have a couple slides of this, so bear with me. Now, if you're doing a low to moderate intensity workout like walking or jogging, that can be termed a general warm-up. So you don't really need to warm up prior to a slow walk or a slow jog. Now, if we look at the American College of Sports Medicine for a guideline, they're going to give us a standard that 5 to 10 minutes of general low to moderate intensity exercise should happen prior to vigorous workouts or competition like we just discussed. And we want to increase our body temperature. We want to increase our muscle temperature. We want to prepare our heart as well as our full body for exercise. And we typically, um, we typically want to use a dynamic warm-up with things like walking, jogging, and then body weight movings, calisthenics. Some examples of calisthenics could be some jumping jacks. We could be doing some uh, <clears throat> lunges. We could do, be doing some knee hugs, some uh, ankle to butts. Okay, we could be doing some of our, our scoops or bend and snaps. Those are types of calisthenics that we're talking about. Oh, the lag on this shift is really killing me. 
Come on, computer, you're better than this. Now, if we look at the other governing body, the NSCA, which is the National Strength and Conditioning Association, they're going to give you a more strength and power oriented warm up um, standard. So, dynamic exercises prior to a workout for strength, speed, and power, we're looking at jogging, skipping, hopping, jumping. Those are some new ones we didn't see from the ACSM. Maybe some sport specific warm up drills after your general warm up drills. So, if you play basketball, maybe you would do your warm up, then you would shoot around a little bit, or if you played baseball, you would do your warm up, then you would swing your bat, throw the baseball a little bit. And again, it's this concept of increasing the temperature in the body and preparing the musculature for activity. Stretching can be used in part of your warm ups, but what the literature tells us, what, what research tells us, is that it needs to be held for less than 30 seconds. Up to about 30 seconds, and I looked up a couple studies here, I posted them in the reference section at the end, up to about 30 seconds, we don't see any uh, negative performance decrements, but past 30 seconds, up to about 60 seconds and further, we start to see um, a small percentage decrease over time. And I'm not talking 50, 60, 70 percent. I'm talking, you know, up to 45 seconds, you might see like an 8 percent decrease. Up to 60, you might see a 15 percent decrease. But put that in perspective. If you're trying to have um, a personal best for a day, let's say <clears throat> in a vertical jump test, that 15 percent could be the difference between you getting a new personal best and you achieving maybe a personal worst because vertical jumps are a game of inches, right? Stretching for flexibility should be a separate part of the workout. That's why we usually put it in the end. And not included in the warm-up. Again, not included unless the stretches are held for less than 30 seconds. So if we go back again and look at what the ACSM recommends for static stretching, it's going to say that flexibility should be performed as part of the workout, so it's separate entity in the workout, or as a separate workout after the cool-down. Right. So even as the cool-down, they're saying that it could be kind of an issue, even though I like to implement it as part of the cool down because I believe it has a beneficial part of the cool down. So you could take that and look at our classes, for example, and say that's probably why we do a dynamic warm up and then we do our workout and then we follow that with flexibility, which is our cool down routine. So what about cool down now that we looked at warm up? The ACSM, again, American College of Sports Medicine, is going to recommend a 5 to 10 minute cool down using activities like walking or jogging. Again, we're going back to that low to moderate activity level, right? Something nice and easy. And there's just a few guidelines here. Um, you shouldn't be going straight to a static position after a workout, right? That's why it says do not lie or sit down immediately after an activity. You shouldn't be, or excuse me, you should gradually reduce the intensity during a cool down, right? So if you did some high intensity sprints, let's say you were running at 100%, you might jog a little bit at about 75%, and then progressively over the course of five to 10 minutes, you get down to 50%, down to 25% where you're walking, and then down to 0% where you're standing still. But you do it progressively over that five to 10 minutes, getting back to a resting state from this highly agitated exercise state. You can walk, um, you can do some total body movements similar to what you would do in the warm-up, right, right? Maybe not as vigorous, not as intense, maybe a little bit at a slower pace, but those would be similar to some of the movements they're talking about. And then, um, like I said, I think stretching and flexibility, as well as so does the NSCA, uh, thinks that those could be included as part of an appropriate cool down. But if we're looking at ACSM, remember, they want to see a nice 5 to 10 walk jog period where you're gradually coming off of that high intensity routine, and then you're jumping into those stretches and flexibilities. And, and for the most part, the ACSM and the NSCA have a mutual agreement with, with most things. So I'm going to show you this every single time because I think it's important to always know where your information is coming from instead of just saying, my information comes from Mr. Cullen Carroll. No. I purely looked at a couple of texts, okay? One of our main texts is Fitness for Life by Mr. Corbin here. <clears throat> it's a very common physical education book. That's where we're going to get most of our information for these lectures throughout the year. 
but also I do a little bit of extra work on the side if I have to pull a different article. So like I mentioned, I wanted to pull some extra information on static and dynamic stretching and the differences between the two, particularly with the reference to um, stretching for no longer than 30 seconds as part of your warm up. And I pulled that from this study in 2011. And the reason I did that was because in Mr. Corbin's book, it says stretching for longer than 60 seconds was going to be detrimental to physical activity. Now, when I looked in the literature, I found quite a few studies that said it was at 30 seconds, you're going to experience a detriment in your performance. Okay, I'm not saying Mr. Corbin is wrong. I'm purely saying that my belief of static stretches as part of the warm-up is going to be an absolute negative. Okay, I think it's best, best suited for after the workout. And I would make one exception there. I think static stretches are very important for people that have movement disorders, maybe some type of movement dysfunction where they need to properly lengthen out a muscle if they have a lot of tightness in an area prior to a workout. But I think it's very rare that you have that situation. That usually happens in, in a lot of diseased populations or very sedentary populations. And when we're working at the high school, we just we don't typically have that a lot because we are moving around for most of the day, even if you're just getting up, sitting down, walking around the classroom. It's a lot of it's a lot of movement compared to what a typical sedentary individual does, which is practically nothing but sit down for an entire day. So I wanted to pull those couple of resources for you. I will always have references at the end of our lectures for you to look up if you feel the need to. If not, I'm going to try and provide as much information from the sources as possible. So with that being said, thank you for sitting through the first lecture in the Physical Education with Coach lecture series, and I hope you have a fantastic day.